Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And given your fine introduction to the panel and our constraints on time, I want to pass the baton directly to Dr. Pitt, who is the Associate Dean of the Faculty of Political Science at Chulalongkorn University and has in recent times been conducting extensive research on digital politics in Thailand and also on electoral trends in Thailand's capital city, Bangkok. Dr. Pitt. Could you unmute yourself, Dr. Pitt? There Hello. we go. Yes. Um, let me start uh, my talk on the Thai political outlook, especially uh, in the realm of uh, politics. Okay. Um, the uh, 2020 was the the year that the the monarchies and the armies and the uh, technocratic bureaucratic state and uh, big business and the conventional Buddhist patriarchal social structure have been heavily shaken with the unprecedented political uprising in Thailand from those who are outside existing power structures. Uh, well, we are talking about the youth quake uprisings. Okay. The COVID-19 did not start this political turmoil. Uh, it is the most important intervening factor anyway. Uh, the COVID-19 intensifies and deepening the Thailand's crisis of legitimacy, politics, economies, and societies. Now Thailand is in the second wave of the COVID pandemics, but the government still denies the magnitude of this catastrophe. Thailand's political outlook from the I mean, for the 2021, it's not very really cheerful. Our crisis will be intensified. There's no sign of compromise. Okay. Um, let me wrap up what's going on in the year 2020, uh, especially in terms of the important political development and maldevelopment. Um, so the constitution and constitutional institutions uh, such as uh, appointed senates and appointed independence organizations, uh, I mean, constitutional court and the uh, anti-corruption commissions are actually sorts of political crisis. They're not <laughs> those who actually uh, intend to solve political crisis. Okay. Um, there's also a disqualification of future forward party, which is the most progressive, the most anti-regime uh, parties, and also the most popular parties among the youth and the new generations. Well, the militaries has been monarchized and become low profile this year. However, military and other security forces such as police are very incompetent and become a liability of the system. Okay, uh, I will give you detail later when we deal with COVID uh, crisis. And there is also a regime contention, which is, I think, the biggest one uh, so far since the revolution in 1932. Right? Uh, in short, uh, it's the struggle over the true meaning of what is the constitution in Thailand. Whether we're talking about the constitutional monarchy, or the things called monarchical constitutions or the monarchized constitutions. And this is uh, happened. Uh, this is result in the youth quake uh, uprisings and the constitutional revision, which is really slow. Let me talk about the first wave of COVID-19, which uh, is around five months, okay? The first case uh, actually Thailand is the country that filed the first case outside China early in January from the Chinese tourists. And then the, we also filed the first domestic case uh, by the end of January from the airport taxi driver. Okay, of course, connected with the Chinese wave of tourists. Um, 
Then there's uh, several hot spot in March. Well, three big one is uh, entertainment bar in Bangkok, army boxing stadium in Bangkok, and the religious pilgrimage returnees from Malaysia in the southern part of Thailand. Okay. Well, total number is around 4,000 something. And we reach zero infection in May. But well, in July, there's some kind of cases that uh, people start to worry, such as the Egyptian soldiers and the Sudanese diplomat that did not comply to the state quarantine procedures. They uh, didn't get into the uh, quarantine, uh, state quarantine system. But how the government handled the first wave of COVID? Um, well, start from the sl very slow decision to lock down and then over centralization, but very incompetent. Uh, they started to shut down the airport on the very end of March after many spreads. Okay, the over centralization of Prayut with uh, Prime Minister Prayut with emergency decree, right, with uh, nationwide lockdown and curfew. However, uh, that is low, ineffective, and non-inclusive recovery policies. Uh, there's very uh, shortage of uh, uh, loans and very not inclusive uh, uh, help out to the poor. Only three months of limited amount of funds for the poor outside the formal employees uh, employment system. And also... Um, well, there's a lot of big business favor in the policy. Uh, well, even though the big business, which very close to the government, very reluctant to help our governments financially. Okay. Well, the government closed down uh, uh, free market, but not the big shopping mall and the convenience store at the beginning. The GDP is uh, really in decline. Then there's a youth quake, which started around August. Well, the genesis of it, I would say that it started since uh, uh, very end of uh, 2019 and early uh, before the COVID, when the future forward parties uh, got dissolved by the constitutional court. There were, there were two flash mobs organized by Future Forward. And then also they spread out into many countrywide gathering in colleges. And also there's a disappearance of political activists in exile. Uh, many cases involved with the Les Majeste. Then the, there was a COVID lockdown and poor recovery management, as I said. The army, the police, and bureaucracy, they are involved with those hotspots like the army uh, boxing stadium, right? They were supposed to be locked down, but they uh, organized the event that got into the hotspots uh, spread out. So after college and school started around June, right? There's so many kind of gathering online and offline. This is for the first time that there's a big offline uh, gatherings, uh, so many places, but actually it started from the online during the COVID. From Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok, one of the biggest Facebook group organized during the COVID time was called the Royalist Marketplace. It's actually a very kind of uh, gathering of the uh, those who are very critical to the monarchy and to the regimes. It reached out to million subscribers they got closed down and they re reopened it in a few days and they reached out to millions of people again. Those who involved with these uprisings are the so-called young generation, which comprise anti-coup activists, first-time voters from college, and also high school students, which is the first time that's a lot of high school students involved with this uh, uh, gathering. The transgender and those who fed up with the Prayut administrations. Then there's a debate whether this movement is new or not new, right? But we call it leaderless movement or new form of leadership because there is anonymous network of organizers. There's a spread out of so many gatherings 
And the leader seemed to be an internet influencer, especially those outside the country, like those academic in exile, like my uh, good friend, Pawin Chachawan Pongpan, who was at the ISIS before. Okay. Well, there's also the issue of the king and the monarchy. There's a, a increase in criticism of the proper role of the monarchies in the time of crisis in particular, and in democratic politics in general. The king spent most of his time outside the country during this uh, COVID crisis. Well, there's so many development of proposal for change. Okay, started from stop political suppression, intimidations, uh, parliamentary dissolutions, the new elections, and the new constitution, uh, because the constitution was not very in favor of democratization. There's so many things, educational reform, same-sex marriage, up to resignation of Prayut, the monarchy reform, right? Asking for the true meaning of constitutional monarchies, financial transparencies, freedom of criticisms, and also the inappropriate, inappropriate, even though it's personal behavior of the king, and the ask for no more long stay outside Thailand. Okay. And some group even went further to the proposal for republicanism and communism, which simply mean more welfare. Okay. Then there's a lot of strike back from the state. Uh, well, there's a politicization of public gatherings. Uh, uh, public gatherings law, the pandemic control law, and emergency laws. There's also media suppressions, internet bans, including they ban porn hubs too, because the, in porn hub they publish a lot of the clip of the king. Okay. Uh, well, the seditious law charge, emergency decree law charge, public gathering law charge, computer criminal law charge information operation wars, the physical crackdowns by the police. Then there's a return of the less majesty charge, which actually at the beginning of the reign, the government said that there will be, there would be no more less majesty charge. It's also royal mass mobilization of supporter as well, especially the yellow, and also the delay of constitutional revisions. So let me get to the second wave COVID, November 2020. And um, well, in a month, actually, it reached out from uh, one province to 56 provinces out of 77 provinces in Thailand. Okay. The total number, well, is almost 9,000 as of yesterday, but only in the second wave that start in November, we already have almost 5,000 infected only in a month, okay? Well, despite the fact that we have everyday detection, uh, well below 10, usually from the state quarantine facility, from those who come back from abroad. Um, in November, we started to got the first case from the North well, from those who, from one lady who crossed the border to work in Myanmar, and then she came back, and then she went to several entertainment spots in the north. December, the biggest uh, hotspot, there was a detection of the Thai owner of shrimp supplier in Samusak Horn uh, seafood market. In two days, we started the active fighting case among Myanmar immigration workers the cross-border immigration worker, usually illegal, okay? So the first time that we got the case was almost 600 in one day. Well, so this spread out through central province and Bangkok. In December as well, by late December, we got another big spot at the eastern part of Thailand from illegal gambling dens in Rayong, which is a big industrial town. The government handled the second wave by denying to call the second wave. They call it the new wave, probably because of the fear like the Spanish flu that the second wave seemed to be more destructive than the first wave. There's still, uh, the government so far uh, have no lockdown policy, but they have the disguised form of lockdown. They declare zone of control, give autonomy to each governor to lock down without resources. One of the uh, government person, the spokesperson of the 
COVID center management said we have no stimulation, no stimulus, no stimulus plan because we have no money to spend. We have no tax money to spend now. Okay. The security forces and the state become less legitimate because for three cases involving the border, the human trafficking, and the all the illegal gambling plays, they reflect the incompetence of the bureaucratic state to control the borders, the borders, the corruptions of human trafficking and illegal casino. There's also skepticism of vaccine plan now in terms of priority of distribution and contracts. This is my last slide. Thailand in 2021. Well, are we living in the post-COVID society or actually it's a politically coma society as a new normal? Well, I would say that this will be our return of our conflict with no compromise. This is uh, the second wave of political crisis. Well, the constitutional revision will be very delayed and denied. Okay, that will result in more political engagement outside the parliament. There will be more conflict in third generation and class. There's a three possible election this year, rural and urban municipality elections, the constitutional drafting committees and the Bangkok governor and the future forward party, which represent the young generation's uh, uh, aspiration. They now change themselves into the political group and under the law, they are allowed to, mo uh, to have a campaign. They did quite of pretty Im impressive uh, uh, in the last year uh, provincial uh, local election, even though they didn't get a lot of vote, but people didn't vote them less, okay? But the first time bomb will be after the end of this month, because that will be the end of the work from home period and the end of the online class. Students will be back on campus and for, to school, right? And if the government cannot handle COVID, 19 second wave very well this month. I think everything will be repeated like last year and more intensification because of the debates over the constitution revisions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pitt. To move to our second speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Girida Paupichit, who is the director of the Economic Intelligence Service at the Thailand Development Research Institute and who spent a decade and a half as the World Bank's country economist for Thailand. Dr. Kirida. Thank you so much, Kun Mike, and good morning, good afternoon um, to all of you from Bangkok. Um, so I'd like to share you know, our views from the Thailand Development Research Institute on how we see the economy of Thailand uh, progressing this year, how do we see the recovery of the e economy and also what are the risks and what are the opportunities that we can see you know, um, three to five years from now. So I hope this will be um, useful. I have um, a few slides that I would like to, to use. And um, I just like to mention that the most important determinant of Thailand's uh, economic performance and its recovery is the COVID-19 pandemic, not only in Thailand, but also globally. So, um, you know, with that, you know, we will have to actually look quite a bit into how the global uh, recovery is doing and looking at what the World Bank or the IMF or the ADB puts out, it seems like the global economy is contracting um, a lot and it won't go back to its 2019 level until 2022. So, which is why the Thai economy will also gradually recover um, and probably will be back in its 2019 level um, by the end of 2022 at the earliest. So this graph shows the projection for the Thai um, economic growth um, last year, which contracted by almost 10%. Um, and it only, you know, is going to grow by around maybe three to 4% this year. So it's not going back to its pre-crisis um, level anytime soon. So at the earliest, probably by the end of 2022. And the reason for this is, as I mentioned earlier, is that because 
Thailand depends a lot on the external um, economy, meaning the global economy. 55% um, of our economy or, or our GDP uh, is exports. Another 12% is international tourism. So, you know, just those two accounts for, you know, a large chunk of our economy. So until those recover, um, we won't see the Thai economy recover. So here um, in this uh, graph is the projection of our current account balance, which is nothing but the trade balance plus the service um, balance. So as you can see here that the trade, um, the service, sorry, the trade and service um, balances, which is called the current account balance, has fallen quite a bit in 2020. Uh, and it we not, will not go back to its um, pre-COVID or nine, uh, 2019 level until around 2023. So which is why, you know, we think that the Thai economy would go back to its pre-COVID level only until the end of 2022 or beginning of 2023. So other than that, you know, we will also see that the Thai baht has appreciated. And this was a surprise to everyone because when the economy um, does not do well, usually the, the currency will depreciate. But the Thai baht has continued to appreciate against the U.S. dollar. And there are two reasons for that. One is because the U.S. dollar itself has been depreciating quite a bit over the past three to four months with the massive quantitative easing that the U.S. is doing. So as the U.S. depreciate, you know, the Thai baht um, appreciates vis-a-vis um, -vis the U.S. dollar. And of course, we still have uh, money flowing into our country because as you, I showed you just now, our current account is still in surplus. There is still money coming. Although our exports has fallen, our imports have fallen even more. So there's still a, a, a surplus in trade that is you know, um, coming into Thailand. So you can see here that the Thai baht will continue to appreciate. It will be around you know, 30 um, baht to the dollar by, you know, 2022. But comparing the Thai baht to other currencies in the region, we are, you know, we are not an outlier, meaning that other currencies in the region, um, whether it be the, you know, Singapore dollar, Philippine peso, um, or even the Indonesia rupiah, uh, you know, are also on an appreciating trend because the US dollar has weakened, as I mentioned. So if comparing the baht to the other currencies in the region, we're sort of in the middle. Um, there are a few currencies that will be weaker than the Thai baht this year. And the graph on the right actually shows a projection five years um, from now. It also shows that um, the Thai baht will be you know, weaker than uh, the Philippine peso, than um, the Chinese renminbi, than the Japanese yen. But it would probably be a bit stronger, you know, than um, you know the uh, Indonesia rupiah, for example, or the um, in uh, or the India uh, rupee. So you know, we can see that um, Thai baht is going to um, strengthen, but you know, it's sort of in the middle compared to other countries um, in the region. So let me come to the next topic, which is. Um, I'm trying to move my, my slide, okay, sorry, which is um, exports, because um, exports um, accounts, as I mentioned to you, around 55% of Thailand's um, GDP. So we saw exports falling by around 8% um, last year, and this year it would probably expand by 4 to 5%. So again, it's not going to go back to its 2019 level this year yet. If you look at the products that you know are contracting, that's the products that are below the um, the horizontal axis. There are more products that are contracting uh, compared to 2019 um, than those that are expanding. And you can see that you know many of them have uh, already performed better than during the lockdown period, which is the quarter two of 2020. But you know they're you know they're still not doing as well as the 2019 period. And I'll leave this for you in, in case some of you might be interested to see which products are doing well and which products are still not doing very well. The ones that are doing actually better than the, the pre-COVID period are, for example, rubber products because we are exporting rubber gloves at the moment, um, and and food. Uh, we're doing also pretty well in food and furniture and parts, for example. So you know those are the things that um, you know Thailand is doing better than pre 
um, COVID in terms of exports, but the majority are still below the horizontal um, axis. So that means it's not doing as well. Now, coming to tourism, as I mentioned, tourism accounts for around 12% uh, of our economy or, or GDP. And here I'm, I'm referring to international tourism, but domestic tourism accounts for another 6% of our GDP. So with, the, uh, with international tourism you know, falling you know, to the floor um, since the um, uh, second quarter of last year, we were relying on domestic tourism to rebound. But as you can see in the graph on, on the left-hand side, that until November or even October last year, domestic tourism is only half of what it was in 2000. Um, 19. So, you know, that is not helping much, though. The government is trying to have promotions, you know, to help, um, you know, co-pay for um, tourist activities um, by ties. But it's still not going back to its um, pre-crisis pre -crisis levels yet. So what are the industries that are heavily affected by um, the crisis? So here I've used the concept of the K recovery. Um, which essentially means that if you're in the upper leg of the K, that means that your business is doing better than you know, the um, pre-COVID period. But if you're in the bottom leg of the K, that means you're doing worse than the pre-COVID period, which means in 2019. And the bottom leg of the K can be divided into two groups. One is a group that is actually recovered from the 2020 quarter two lockdown. Um, and the second group are ones that haven't even recovered from the lockdown. So you can see that the majority of Thai businesses are in the lower leg of the K, which means that they're not doing as well as their pre-crisis or pre-COVID um, period. But there are some which are already expanding um, more than uh, the um, their pre-COVID um, levels, as you can see on the top. So things like you know e-commerce, serv uh, delivery services, uh, they're doing better. Um, computer electronic parts, it's doing better. Insurance is doing better because people are worried about their health and they're doing more, um, taking up, taking up more insurance. But you know the majority of businesses are you know are, are contracting from last year. And the interesting thing um, here on this uh, slide is also the number of employment that each of these sectors um, employs. So you can see that actually you know a lot of the sectors that are still contracting from 2020 um, and so, sorry 2019 employ more than a million employees. So this is a lot of implications for um, people's um, incomes as well. So we looked a bit at the um, level of employment um, in, in Thailand. Uh, the latest data that we have is October of last year. And um, the, in the top graph here, the, the bar that is um, highlighted here is where the lockdown was, which is quarter two of 2020. Again, comparing to the lockdown period, things are looking better. <laughs> There's more full-time employment, there is you know, more overtime employment, and there is less part-time employment. But if you look at October 2020, compared to the pre-COVID level, which is October 2019, it's still, it's still worse, right? There, is, there are less um, full-time employment, there is um, less overtime, and there's more part-time employment. And there are also people who are considered part-time, but actually have zero working hours, which is the bottom part of this slide. And there are around 340,000 of them um, as of October who have no working hours, but they still have positions you know, in, in the companies that they work with. So these are people who are at most risk um, of being laid off if, if there is um, another lockdown or if <clears throat> small and medium enterprises cannot last until the end of the COVID, which is very likely this year. So the worry today is you know, how will um, small, small and medium enterprises survive and how will you know, their workers or their staff survive um, after this? This is just to show that, um, you know, sector-wise, we're seeing, you know, um, many sectors that are hiring, you know, hiring people more than during the lockdown period, and some even more than, you know, the um, the pre-COVID periods. But they're usually in the um, the government sectors, <laughs> education. Um, but you know, if you look at wholesale, retail, hotels. Um, they're still not doing well at all in terms of the um, number of employment and also in terms of the work hours of their employees. And again, as I mentioned to you, you know, this is a big sector. It employs around um, 4 million people um, in the, um, the tourism-related sectors. So there's a lot of implications for the purchasing power 
um, of ties um, this year as well. And um, here we, we, we look at um, what uh, a tie is buying <laughs> during um, this COVID period. And on, on the right-hand side, you can see that, you know, the majority of the products that ties buy are still below that of the pre-COVID period. There are just a few products on the top that, you know, has um, grown from the pre-COVID period. And there's some, and there are things like mail order and intranet, or um, they're mainly um, non-durable goods like beverages, tobacco, mm -hmm. and, and some foods. So, you know, it, it shows that the purchasing power of, of Thai, even Thai consumers are, are suffering at the moment. Then of course, you know, when incomes, you know, are not as, as, as high as before, people, you know, um, sort, um, uh, you know, uh, resort to household um, debt, that they borrow more. And of course the um, household debt at the moment is around 84, 85% of our GDP. And this might not have an impact today um, as much, but in the future, um, even after COVID is over, they will have to repay these loans. So this will weigh down their future um, you know, ability to, to consume uh, or their purchasing power. Let's turn a bit to um, investment. Investment um, is now pretty much led by government investment, um, but private investment is still much below its um, pre-COVID level. And it will probably go back to its pre-COVID level in 2022. But there is some you know, good um, indicators that we see, um, especially on the, um, the investments uh, through the Board of Investment that shows that you know, the certificates that the Board of Investment are issuing uh, in 2020 are actually now higher than those that they've actually um, issued in 2019, which means that probably in a year um, to two years, there will be more investments um, coming into Thailand because these things take time to actually materialize. And um, at the moment, you know, it's difficult for foreign investors to, to come in um, uh, to Thailand to invest and capacity utilization is still quite low, as you can see on the top left chart here. So there's no need to invest a lot at the moment, but probably in the next year to two years, there could be more investments now. Let me turn to a sector that is probably the only one that is expanding because it still has resources and that's the government sector. The government sector actually has still ample resources to spend, especially this year. Um, if you have been following news in Thailand, last year the government um, issued a royal um, decree to borrow one trillion baht, which is equivalent to around 6% of GDP. Not, not a lot, but it's, um, it's a sizable um, package. But as of today, um, only around you know, 30, 32% of that has been dispersed. So we still have quite a bit of money in, 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 um, from this loan. So there's still around almost 700 billion baht left um, in this and uh, this loan to be dispersed. So if we actually look at how much money the, the, uh, the government um, has, and, and here I'm saying uh, the government uh, loosely, it's probably the public sector because I'm also including the state-owned enterprises here. They have a lot of money. Um, it could be up to 4.4 trillion baht or a 21% increase from last year. Um, this includes the one you know, trillion baht load that has not been dispersed. So there is, re there is enough resource to spend. And um, you know, by September this year, our public debt to GDP um, will be around 57%, uh, which is not that high yet. I mean, we could still borrow more if we want to um, until 60 or 65% if needed. So um, the government does have money, but the problem is they are dispersing it pretty slowly, as you can see from the um, one trillion baht loan that you know only thirty percent has been dispersed, you know, um, so far. Um, so that's you know the, um, the the government sector. So if I I would you know um, conclude on the the Thai economy, I would say that you know the K recovery, um, the upper leg of the K would be government spending. And there will be e-commerce and other products that are exporting well. Well, the majority of the sectors in Thailand are still contracting from the pre-COVID period. So it's in the lower leg of the K, as you can see here. But, you know, there are also, you know, some risks that I would like to highlight as well and some opportunities as well. Um, some of the risks that, that we see over the next few years would come from external because, as I mentioned, Thailand relies quite a bit on the external economy. So, you know, things like, you know, um, you know, 
know, the decline in globalization will affect high exports. Um, if the U.S. joins um, the CPTPP, um, that will affect high exports to the U.S. because Thailand um, is not a member of the CPTPP. U.S.-China conflicts, of course, and, you know, if there um, happens to be a financial crisis in a mid-sized country in Asia, um, you know, post-COVID, um, you know, that would definitely have contagion to Thailand. Well, in the domestic side, I think there are more <laughs> risks on the domestic side. Um, we actually think that the domestic um, economy will, uh, the, the recovery of the domestic economy will be delayed um, even when the pandemic is over. Because as I mentioned, many of these small and medium enterprises will not be able to last until you know, the pandemic is over because of liquidity issues. And you know, this would then, you know, um, cause the recovery of the Thai economy to be slower even after the COVID pandemic ends. And, and with the you know, reduction in the number of SMEs or small and medium enterprises, we will see the rise of large companies, large firms, which are already big in Thailand. They will grow even bigger. And this might you know, have implications on um, less competition in Thailand as well. Of course, on other issues is Thailand competitiveness compared to other countries in the region, such as um, Vietnam, who have been taking lots of um, reforms, but Thailand hasn't been taking much over the past few years. Um, government systems um, are, you know, are, are pretty slow, as Dr. Pitt has mentioned. Um, a good example is how the, the COVID pandemic is handled here um, when, when there is this new wave. Um, the aging society in Thailand, you know, we're aging very rapidly. Uh, we're already an aging society and it will only be faster with, with this crisis because people usually have less um, babies when, when crises occur. So uh, aging society will limit Thailand's um, purchasing power and spending in, in the future if we don't accept um, you know, talent into our country. Inequality um, will uh, will continue to rise, and of course, if there is a parliamentary dissolution or if there's another coup, then that sets everything back, and you know policies will have to be again, um, you know, um, redrawn, and that would take time, and it would also delay the recovery of the Thai economy. So those are the risks that I see. I know I'm taking a bit um, um, more time. I'm so sorry. I'll just talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the opportunities that um, I see in the in the Thai um, you know economy. Of course, one is digitalization. That we see that you know even you know uh, e-commerce is rising very quickly in Thailand as as it is has uh, been doing in the U.S. From home economy will have a big impact on the Thai economy as well because people are staying home more. It, it, it actually impacts a lot on the digital services and also on the transport sector as well. Telemedicine is something that is up and coming in Thailand because of the aging society and also because people don't want to travel to hospitals as much and it saves costs as well. So digitalization is a one, um, one opportunity that we see. The other is tourism. We see that tourism will recover after post um, COVID, um, but the pattern will be a bit different. We think in the beginning of the recovery, there will be more Chinese tourists coming to Thailand as a share of total tourists and also medical tourism, which Thailand has, has been good at. If it's able to, to um, uh, contain this current wave of, of outbreak and create uh, you know, good name for itself, then you know, uh, medical tourism will be another opportunity here in Thailand. Just a few more. Uh, manufacturing, we're seeing a lot of relocation from China into Southeast Asia. I have some examples here to show you that there has been relocation of companies out of China. There are companies from the US, from South Korea, from Taiwan, from Japan that has been relocating out of China. And of course, the majority goes to Vietnam, but Thailand is, is the second highest uh, recipient of this relocation. And we're mostly receiving um, investments in um, electronics, in electrical appliances and uh, in auto parts because that's what you know, Thailand is, um, has a base for it's good at and uh, it's, it's a bit capital intensive. So that, those are opportunities um, for Thailand as well in terms of receiving um, uh, investments from overseas. Agriculture, um, I see uh, opportunities in the bio, um, uh, products that um, are in you know, great demand right now, especially in the West, whether it be uh, plant-based proteins or plant, you know, or, or um, even, you know, uh, 
biodegradable um, substances um, that are replacing plastics, those are made from agricultural product, produce. So, you know, that's a, um, a, an opportunity for Thailand as well because we have a lot of raw materials here. Um, in, in energy sector, we think uh, renewable energy will, will be back, but it will take some time because now oil is pretty cheap. So that will be an opportunity for the future um, in, in Thailand. Lastly, I would like to mention that the banking sector in Thailand is transforming very quickly. Um, it will, uh, you know, go, you know, all the all, you know, to um, digital very quickly. And it, banks in Thailand will want to find partners in healthcare and insurance services, and even they're doing delivery right now because um, they see that, you know, data is is quite important for their. Um, business in the future. And lastly, I think in the real estate sector, we have um, opportunities as well. Things are very cheap here now. Um, there are lots of condominiums, hotels that are on sale uh, at a cheap price. But after the COVID pandemic is over, um, we think that, you know, um, these will come back. Large hotels will come back. Um, you know, uh, facilities for the aging population will be back. And and also the fact that you know people would you know want more homes in the suburbs, and that's a, a new opportunity for real estate developers as well. So that's all I'd like to mention in terms of um, the um, growth prospects and the risks and opportunities for Thai economy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirida. Uh, rather than pose two questions of my own, I'm going to open the floor directly to questions from participants. At the same time, however, we're going to release the poll questions for this panel on Thailand. And we ask you to take about five minutes to respond to those poll questions. And time allowing, we'll discuss your re responses to those questions uh, when those responses are in. But let me turn immediately to the questions that we have from uh, six of our participants. The first comes from uh, Daryl Lim, and it's for Dr. Pitt. And he asks how Dr. Pitt believes that the protests will play out for the government and for the protesters, and what the tipping point will be. When you mention no compromise, what does that entail? Will the protest just die off, or will the protests continue to go on without any compromise from the government? Another question from my colleague at ICS, Dr. Domsak, is related. He wonders what you mean, Dr. Pitt, when you say that there's no compromise. Are you referring specifically to issues involving the monarchy? Dr. Pitt? Uh, yes, uh, well, the word compromise actually came from the king in one of his interviews, right? That uh, Thailand is a country of compromise after the, uh, his, uh, the question from the, I think the BBC is on channel four. Uh, but um, well, so far there's still a lot of uh, cases uh, that the, the legal case that the police uh, started to sue the protesters. And the, if you see the proposal from the protesters, some of the, the, the main group uh, by the end of last year, they talk about republicans and communism. They, whether they uh, have a real intention or not, it show that there will be a long way to go for any kind of big uh, uh, structural change. But um, well, I would say that when we talk about the the protests, right? This year, the protests will go. Uh, we, we, there will be still a lot of protests, uh, both uh, online and offline, as long uh, there will be a relationship between the protests and the, the pace of uh, constitutional reform. Okay, so if the constitutional reform is getting very slow, the protests will be intensified. And also if we have no uh, protests outside the parliament, there will be, the, everything will be slow too. So, uh, well, by I mean, no compromise means there's no real intention for both sides to, to, uh, uh, to, to lower their kind of uh, uh, idea to maintain the power or to also to, uh, to, to accept any kind of uh, uh, middle ground. There's still no middle ground. Right, the coming back of the less majestic charge, it's still uh, very evident 
However, in terms of the less majestic charge, right? There's still two more steps. Okay. Now the less majestic charge is in the is in the police uh, process. There will be into the state attorney and there will be into the court. Okay. So it's still a long way to go, right? But it's kind of the the charge that will kind of fix or put. Uh, all of the the key protester in place that they cannot actually do anything more, right? Because they then they actually on bail. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, we now have a pair of questions for uh, Dr. Kirida, and I will ask both of these questions of her uh, right away. The first is from Uday Banu Singh, wondering what the prospects are for BIMSTEC and Thailand's role in post-COVID times. Will the completion of the trilateral highway uh, create some positive outcomes? The second question also relating to the economy is for Daniel Moss, who says that Thailand was recently added to the US Treasury's monitoring list for possible currency manipulation. How seriously is this being taken in Thailand? And what is your perspective on the consequences of this? So you, one, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, for the first question, I must admit, I haven't been following BIMSTEC that closely, but in Thailand here, we've we not heard a lot about the development of BIMSTEC um, recently. And of course, if, if the infrastructure is completed as planned, it will be quite um, useful. But since the COVID outbreak, um, we haven't heard um, much about that here in Thailand. And I must apologize, I haven't followed much on that. But I've been following more on the monitoring list that Daniel has asked on um, the fact that the, uh, the, the US um, has put Thailand on the monitoring list as a currency, uh, a watch list, um, as a currency manipulator, because we have um, met two of the three criteria for being a currency manipulator, sorry. And um, on the question, what is the impact of that? And is it taken very seriously here? Yes, it is. It's taken um, quite seriously by the Bank of Thailand. And just today, the Bank of Thailand announced just actually a few minutes ago that they will have some long-term measures. We'll have to watch for what measures they will announce that will actually um, you know, reduce the, um, the appreciation of the BAT. Uh, again, you know, this is um, quite tricky because the BAT has appreciated, as mentioned, because the U.S. dollar has weakened and there is so money flowing into Thailand. But at the same time, you know, if the bot um, appreciates, um, you know, this will be, you know, um, uh, detrimental for for exports. But at the same time, you know, the the U.S. you know would would like uh, Thailand's currency to appreciate rather than depreciate. So you know, so this is a, a dilemma here that the Bank of Thailand is taking very seriously. Thank you. We have three questions now for uh, Dr. Pitt. Two of them come from uh, John Bitson at Export Development Canada. The first is, how broad is support for youth protesters among older members of the middle class, such as the parents of the protesters? The second question from John Bitson is, how likely it is, is it that Thailand will see a return to street clashes and the sort of tragic violence seen in 2010, for example? A final question for Dr. Pitt is from uh, Fujishita Wataru, is there any possibility for the king himself to have a dialogue with protesters in order to avoid political conflict? Well, um, the the old middle class that used to support the coup regimes now changing a lot uh, when it comes to the so-called intergenerational conflict because a lot of the protesters are actually their, their kids Right? And I've seen so many cases that the parent was a very strong supporter of the PDRCs or the yellow shirt. And now that their kids got charged by the 112 or the seditious charge. So actually the popularity of the government is going down and down. Okay, so there's a, lot, a big shift. That's, I think, one of the reasons why we, there's a big delay in Bangkok governor elections now. Right, because uh, they, they say Bangkok governor election hasn't been fixed yet. And I'm not sure this year we will have it or not. Uh, maybe next year, because the government know that they're not the most popular one. However, among the 
opposition party that is still no unity. So if there is a governor election, the all the op, if the all the opposition party decide to send their own candidate, right? The government may win in the Bangkok governor election because the 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 vote for the 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 anti government vote will be splitted over all the opposition parties. And uh, the street crash, uh, there was a small one uh, last year, but I think now so far there is a big crash online rather than offline. And uh, well, this is a good sign because that if there is a street crash, uh, there will be a, a pretext to the coup, right? And so far there's still no, no street crash in a big scale, okay? And for the king, well, I think there's a big change in terms of his move, but it's not going to be on the 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 manner of a uh, dialogue, right? As I said in my presentation on the royal mobilization of the supporter, uh, for the past three years, right, since he got into the throne, he seemed to stay outside the country and stay outside the cloud, right? Uh, stay outside the, the, uh, the people, right? But after a lot of criticism, there's more events that he and his wife and his concubine and his family uh, visited several temples and uh, to many uh, ceremony. And then he uh, opened up an opportunity for people to get close to him even to touch him, even to talk to him, but they are for those who support him, right? So I don't see any kind of uh, the direction into the dialogue between the king and the new uh, generations, especially those who uh, be very skeptical to his role. Thank you. We now have a question for both of you from Robert Fox who notes that Thailand has missed opportunities for digitalization, especially in digital governments. And immigration is a prime example. Digitalization would, Mr. Fox says, reduce corruption and enhance ease of doing business, which should improve FDI. Does either of you have any insights into this issue? Okay, let me start first, because it's not very useful. Uh, well, we miss opportunities and uh, the digital ministry that was uh, intentionally set up during taxing time to, uh, to prepare for our digital infrastructure, especially to provide uh, economic incentive and infrastructure for digital economies now has been politicized. And the minister spent most of his time charging people over uh, Computer Crime Act. Okay. Dr. Kirida? Sure. Um, thank you, Kun Bob, for that question. Uh, well, you know, Thailand has been embarking on you know the digitalization across the country for a while now. We have um, a you know a broadband master plan that has been um, rolled out a few years ago. Um, but of course it's it's still progressing um, slowly. That's on, on the part that they would like to provide to um, the, the people of Thailand. But in the government itself, in terms of using digital technologies within the government, we have seen some progress so far. Um, for example, in the um, you know, linking of the database between the uh, Ministry of Interior when we go to make our citizen ID, which is quite fast right now, or with the land transport department, when they go to extend our car you know, registration. Those are now you know, much, much faster than let's say 10 years ago. But of course there needs to be much more. Um, other than these two or three ministries, there, there are still not many other ministries that have linked data together. Most of their data are still paper-based. Um, and this is something that the, uh, the Office of the Public Sector Development Commission, which uh, TDRI is also working with, is trying to integrate and use, um, you know, have ministries use more digital technology in terms of data and also in terms of serving um, the people. Thank you very much. Uh, could I now ask that the poll results uh, be released, please? And while those are uh, being shared, I have two questions relating to COVID for our two panelists. 
The first is whether the panel members agree that economic, the economic impact of COVID-19 will only increase social tensions and unrest. And that comes from Victor Mills of the Singapore International Chamber of Commerce. The second question is from Mr. Albert Y, asking for elaboration on Dr. Pitt's comment that there is skepticism about the vaccination plan in Thailand when the government has announced that there are 63 million doses of COVID vaccination in the pipeline. Thank you. Um, well, uh, the economic impact, I think will be a very important one for the legitimacy of the government. And uh, now the uh, slowness and ineffective recovery plan, especially for the second wave, is in the pipeline, I mean, not the policy. So uh, I think people will get more upset, but with the, with, the, with, the, with the pandemic now, there's still no room for the offline uh, protest yet, but the legitimacy is getting uh, down and it will resolve with all the slowness in terms of constitutional revisions and uh, local elections. And second one, uh, the vaccine, the skepticism of vaccine. Now the story is more complicated, okay? At first, uh, the government secured only one-fourth of the vaccine supply uh, for the Thai, right, from the, the Oxford-based company. And there's a lot of debate on the priority that the government will use. And uh, in the last few days, and especially yesterday, the government announced that they finally secured uh, all the vaccine supply, but it's from uh, China with the involvement with the CP, uh, which is the largest uh, company in Thailand, plus the, the King's company too. Uh, and this decision uh, is very rapid and didn't really get into all the, the debate in the parliament and the public yet, okay? So I'm not sure what's going on with the quality of the Chinese uh, one that the government said yesterday that they finally get all the vaccine to the, for the Thai people, but it will be mostly from China, okay? And with the investment from CP and the King. From my side, um... I'd like to share my views on the economic um, side. I think um, the COVID pandemic has a lot of uh, economic impact, especially this um, wave, which will impact a lot of small and medium enterprises whom I've mentioned earlier have been hurt in the first round and haven't been assisted at all by the government. And should you know there be a shutdown again in this second wave, um, small and medium enterprises along with their um, employees will not be able to survive. And this would, definitely exacerbate their unhappiness, their, you know, um, uh, grievance towards the government as well. In terms of the vaccine, I don't think it will help uh, much because um, vaccines will not come in, uh, you know, in, in large quantities, probably until, you know, the second half of the year. We're lucky. Um, as Dr. Pitt says, we have tried to secure vaccines from different sources. But again, from AstraZeneca, for example, we have um, uh, bought 26 million doses, which was served 13 million people, but again, that won't come all at once. Uh, we will be producing it and we will be getting 10% of that, which is 2.6 million each month. So it will take a lot of time before 60 or 70% of the Thai population is actually vaccinated. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, a minute and a half left and I want to report very quickly the results of our poll and then ask each of you to take about 30 seconds to react to these results. In the response to the first question about how Thailand can most effectively solve its political crisis, 75% of participants believe that undertaking an inclusive and orderly process of constitutional reform is the most promising approach to solving Thailand's political crisis. In response to the question about the most important focus of Thailand's recovery from the COVID-19 economic crisis, 38% thought that rapidly restoring the tourism and export dependent economy of the past would be the most important focus. While 30% of respondents believe that working to foster innovative sectors of the Thai economy would be the most important focus. 
Finally, on the sensitive issue of the monarchy, 66% of respondents believe that the most promising response to calls for the reform of the Thai monarchy would be the creation of a commission to design a role for the monarchy appropriate to the 21st century. Now, I wonder if our two panelists in the short time that is remaining are able to comment on one or more of these poll results. Well, it's not that easy when we talk about the constitutional reform because even in the parliament, most of the uh, the member they actually are appointed by the government or pro government and pro regime, and they even said that in constitutional reform they didn't want to have any monarchy reform in the constitutional reform. Okay, Dr. Pitt, that gives us our answer. Dr. Kirida, in the seconds that remain to us, what do you make of these results re relating to recovery of the economy? I think that those would be my votes as well, actually. I would like to comment just on the first two. One, one is that, yes, inclusiveness is very important because inequality is something that you know has been bothering ties for a very long time. On economic front, I think I, I would have chosen all of the above because in terms of the recovery, we would need you know demand to come back, but also innovation to do more you know, high level of more value added products and services as well. Well, many thanks, Dr. Jirida, and many thanks, Dr. Pitt, to both of you for participating in this session of the 2021 Regional Outlook Forum. With no further ado, I will bring the session to a close.